Uh, we have the portal vein, and what doctors are looking for, at least in the case of this two-year-old boy that was brought to Stanford in an emergency, is to see whether any of these conducts are obstructed. Okay, and so in a compressed sensing scenario, you can see we, uh, you see that you have much longer detail, and I'm going to show you a blow-up. Okay, and so you see here the portal vein, you see the bile duct right here, and then you're looking for obstruction in here. Uh, you see the concrete duct. And you see all these things, and so um, doctors seem to prefer images like this over images like this. Okay, so I think this is a, a great success story. Um, now it's not my work, so I can say that it's successful. Um, here you see a vein. I see it well on my computer, but you don't see it well. And it's, it's successful in the sense that, for example, going back to this real world story, um, so the, the boy came to Stanford, it was out of the question to take a two-minute scan, so they a, took a 15-second scan, and then they had the doc clear pictures, the doctor saw exactly where there was an obstruction in the, in the, in the duct. Then they, the boy had surgery, they removed the, the obstruction, and now he's doing very well. Uh, yes? there's a lot of denoising that takes place. Ah, so you didn't mention that. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. So of course I could use, I could use it, uh, yeah. I could remove the noise by conventional techniques on this image, yeah. absolutely. But and you see, it. Yeah, of course, of course, and that's a very good point. But yeah. when you do minimization, when you do the L1 minimization subject, you, know, you remove a lot of noise. Like you do, you do filtering. You know, the compressed sensing recovery, by definition, is a filtering operation. And it removes a lot of noise. Absolutely. And in fact, I like your comment because, well, that's a slide I kind of decided to skip, which is we understand very well how much we lose by undersampling in terms of, you know, SNR compared to somebody who would have, would have much more data than we do. And in terms of MSC, of mean squared error, what you lose is, you know, the oversampling, undersampling ratio. Right? So if I have four times data than you do, then my my mean squared error will have to be four times higher than yours. Okay? Because statistical averages are more accurate than individual observations. Okay. All right. Now, okay, so any questions about this? Okay, so this is, uh, okay, so this is like compressed and thinking. Okay, so now, of course, and now I think we can turn on the light because there are no pictures for white, so... Okay. Uh, it has been applied to many other fields in microscopy, holography, computer tomography, hyperspectral imaging, and on to many, many fields. And so the field is far, far, far too big for me to kind of start Okay. So this was compressed sensing, and now, as you pointed out, it's not the same as super resolution, and so I'm going to talk about super resolution now for the rest of the lecture. Okay, so my agenda is very simple. I want to motivate it. I want to introduce the notion of sparsity. I'm going to probably show you how you could super resolve signal by convex optimization. I'm going to talk about stability. I'm going to talk about numerical algorithms. And this work, um, is motivated by a different applied project I'm working on at Stanford with a group of chemists by the name of W.E. Werner, where um, essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to image single molecules. So we've got single molecules here, here, and here. They organize their own filaments, and we would like to image them with as much precision as possible. So the microscope, microscopes that we receive light from fluorescent mic molecules in each image frame, we're going to have only a few, few of the molecules are going to show us, so we're going to have just a few bright spots. Okay. We're going to have multiple uh, frames, and uh, perhaps 10,000. And so from all these frames, we would like to recover to get a super resolved image uh, of all these molecules. Okay, so this is important because uh, you know, the range, some of the range in microscopy is to do actually cell imaging. And so it's very important to, uh, to be able to kind of resolve 
of the locations of molecules as precisely as possible. Okay, so this is a validation. And the problem is that, uh, well, when you look at how molecules will appear on other microscopes, you're going to have a resolution which is much, much coarser than the size of individual molecules. Okay, so when you look at, you would like to, super, to know the location of a molecule very precisely, but you don't because, well, the picture you get under your microscope, a molecule will appear to be much wider than what it really is. And why? Diffraction. Okay, and so the question that everybody asks in physics, or in, in optics, is can we beat the diffraction limit and super resolve molecules? So let me tell you a little bit about diffraction. Do we have people who do not know anything about diffraction? People know about diffraction. Is that a correct assumption? <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's partially what? Only partially correct. It's partially correct. <laughs> okay. So here's the best textbook I've ever read. Uh, it's written by Joe Goodman, and it's about four-year optics. And in this book, you see the physical phenomenon called diffraction is of the utmost importance in the theory of optical imaging systems. Okay. And so each time you have an optical system, whether it's a telescope, whether it's a microscope, whether it's a camera, whether it's anything, it's going to be subject to the laws of diffraction. And the laws of diffraction will limit the resolution of your optical system in a very serious way. In the US, people want to build larger and larger telescopes. Why? To increase resolution, because larger telescopes means higher resolution. And they want to test cosmological models, so they need to know the location of stars very well and fit their cosmological models. And for this, they need bigger and bigger telescopes. Now, the physicists in the United States, from what I understand, they lobby Congress to build telescopes that cost hundreds of millions of dollars because they would be very large. Why? To get very highly resolved pictures. OK, so this is what I'm saying. This is what you should have all seen in, um, in your department that you have a point source that looks something like this. And you're going to try to image it by camera, a telescope, a video camera, a microscope, whatever. No matter what you use, you're not going to, a point source will not appear like as a point source. It will appear as something that looks like this. OK. Okay, so any optical, in any optical imaging system, diffraction imposes a fundamental limit on now, mathematically, um, what you have is what these people call a band limited image system, where there is an object F that you care about, except because if you're going through your optical system, you will not be able to observe F. You will be able to observe F convolved with a low pass curve. Okay, so the observation that you can make are not about F, they are F convolved with a low-pass kernel, which we usually call the point spread function. In the Fourier domain, we know that a convolution is multiplication. And so what that means in the Fourier domain is that in the Fourier domain, I cannot observe the Fourier transform of the signal. I observe it multiplied by the transfer function. Okay. And in all optical systems, we have a situation that looks like this. That is, the frequency exceeds a certain cutoff then the transfer function vanishes. That is, an optical system, what it does, it, re it removes all high frequency information. Okay. Right. So in the data that I get to see, there is no high frequency component. There's just a low frequency. Mm -hmm. But let me give you an example of this. So if we do coherent imaging, um, in coherent imaging, so let's say this is your pupil in your camera. Well, then the transfer function of your optical system will be an indicator function of this. So it will be the indicator function of this disk, mm -hmm. which means that the point spread function, the PSF, will be the inverse Fourier transform of this thing, which is the area disk, which everybody knows in optics. And so if I were to look at the cross section of the area disk, I would see this type of better function. Okay, so this is like what everybody knows. It's like when I have an optical system, I have a 
finite aperture, and this aperture of the start is circular like this, the PSF will be my very disk, and here's the cross-section of the very disk, and if the aperture is square like this, the, of course the PSF will be the product of sync functions, which we see here, and it's the cross-section. Okay, the whole point of what I'm talking about is that you've got a very high resolution signal because it's a signal that looks like this. You've got this single molecule. You have this sequence of delta functions well, here, and then you cannot observe them. They're going to appear to do that. Okay, so uh, just to uh, make sure we're on the same page here, um, what uh, we've got here, we have a single spout, but it would appear like this, and this distance, which is the distance between the peak and the first zero crossing, is typically called the rail distance. Now, what is the super resolution problem? The super resolution problem is a problem of, well, deconvolving this data. So what I've got is I've got low resolution data of this form, and I want to invert it to actually get the super resolved signal that we see here. Now I'm going to have to go back to you. Can I call this super resolution? <laughs> okay, great. okay. So the super resolution problem is to go from what the microscope collects, which is here, to real the, the, the truth, which is something like this. So you have to decompose the signal. If I think about it, if, yes. Why don't I call it the convolution problem? Yeah. Uh, because in optics they call it super resolution. <laughs> <laughs> and I think super resolution sounds bad. <laughs> I think it sounds bad. Okay. But you're right, it's a deconvolution problem. But it's a special kind of deconvolution problem. It's a deconvolution problem where you have really a, a filter that has <coughs> okay, so now I can also look at what happened in the Fourier domain. And in the Fourier domain, I think the fact that we have a band limited system like this, where all the frequencies are zero after frequency cutoff, means what? That the super resolution problem in the frequency domain is something like this. My imaging system, this is a spectrum of the object, my imaging system lets, lets me see this, the object at low frequencies but not at high frequencies. And so what the super resolution problem is in the frequency domain is to extrapolate the spectrum. Because what I want to do is I want from this red portion of the spectrum, I want to recover the blue wings. And so in the frequency domain, this is an extrapolation problem. Okay, so now, um, well, now we've got, in this lecture, we're going to try to super resolve signals that are sparse. And so the signal of interest in this lecture are going to be sparse superposition of point sources. So something that looks like this. So we're going to be interested in an object like, which is a superposition of point sources. And this is motivated by uh, the applications that we talked about, uh, single molecule imaging, because here we really have point sources. Um, or if you want, you know, I would like to locate very precisely uh, celestial bodies in astronomy like stars to test cosmological models. And it's the same problem as, as spectral analysis of this in speech analysis. So we're going to focus on uh, the recovery of sparse structure that looks like this from extremely low pass data. Okay? And that's a problem, as I'm sure many of you know, occurring in radar, in spectroscopy, in astronomy, geophysics, and many other areas as well. Okay, so the mathematical model for uh, the super resolution framework is something like this. I've got a sequence of spikes, and I don't know where they are, and I don't know their amplitudes. And so ma mathematically, I'm going to model it as a sum of amplitudes times they are delta functions at location tau j that are unknown. Now, the thing which is different from what we've seen before is that I'm going to assume that now I'm on the, on the continuum. So this tau j can be anywhere over the continuum. And now I'm going to model what the microscope does. And what the microscope does, it allows me to see the lowest part of the, the low frequencies. And so what the microscope does is co essentially collecting information about the spectrum of the object, but only at low frequencies. Okay, and so 
the data collection process is what compute the Fourier transform of this signal, but only for frequencies k that are less or equal to in absolute value of a frequency color fc, because well, I can only sample the Fourier transform in this area. Okay, so the data collection process is like this, which mathematically I'm going to write as r equals fn dot x. Now, when I have a maximum color frequency, there's immediately this notion of Rayleigh really distance that we have introduced. Whereas the Rayleigh distance is essentially 1 over the frequency curve. Right? So when I have band-limited measurements like this, then I don't have the right to think about resolution, resolving the signal beyond, beyond this diffraction limit, which is 1 over the frequency curve, which is the Rayleigh distance. Okay. And the question, of course, we're going to ask is, well, can we resolve the signal beyond this? So I want to mention something important is that maybe some of you are interested in spectral estimation and it's exactly the same problem. In spectral estimation, I'm just going to swap time and frequency. I have a, time, a, a, a signal as a function of time now, which is a superposition of, uh, of, of Fourier modes with unknown frequencies. And I would like to estimate them as accurately as possible from samples of the form x0, x1, xn minus 1. And that's exactly the same problem, like just swap, swapping time and frequency. So if I swap time and frequency, uh, I'm going to ask whether I can resolve the frequencies beyond the high number. It's exactly the same. If you can do one problem, you can do the other. Okay. So this is why, an important slide, I think, because this is why I want to explain that super resolution is not compressive. In the compressed sensing world, what I can do is I have the freedom to sample the spectrum wherever I want. And so I can sample it at random, and so I can sample it where I want. Of course, I'm going to see very few samples, and the problem becomes, in compressed sensing, is that, well, you've seen very few points of this curve, can you interpolate? In super-resolution, you don't have this luxury. In super-resolution, there's physics that limits what you can do, and so you can